In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And it is The Deal Board, and we are back for another great episode. And we are talking about our favorite subject, which is money and how to get money, especially as we come out of this coronavirus crisis, you know, it's kind of confusing what's out there still with the SBA. There's deadlines coming up. So we have a very special guest in Ami Kassar uh, from Multifunding Inc. and or LLC. And he does a he does a fantastic job for both Jessica and our offices. Um and they, he basically will seek out the perfect fit for your financing deal. So he goes through all that process. And Jessica, you have another great uh, tool for people to get incentives. Yeah, I interviewed our John Chaffee. He's a business broker up in Greenville, um, but he also worked in economic development for a number of years. And, and it's funny because we've been talking about these financing incentive options for like a year or so and how they appeared through COVID. But what John teaches us is the economic development offices actually have permanent programs in place um, for financing that is not SBA and some other economic incentives and also business help. Um, we talk a lot about like how can the offices of economic development help business owners as they're buying or getting started or if you're growing your company. John's just a wealth of knowledge. I know he's been a great resource for brokers in our network, um, but he goes over, you know, how do you find these resources? What are they? And who do you reach out to in your local markets? Yeah, both both guests really bring bringing a lot of good things to the table this week, because I, I mean, the buy side right now is so hot. So many people are looking to buy businesses and start businesses, and I think these are two great guests to understand what's going on out there in the world. Yeah, so we're hoping this will. If you're looking to buy a business or you're just looking for financing in general, this will add a couple different tools to your tool belt. You know, we talk about SBA seven A loans a lot, um, but hopefully this will just give you some other ideas and other options for your business needs. Great, let's get started. Let's do it. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Okay, welcome back to the deal board, everybody. And we have been talking about all the changes in the world these days. And we wanted to bring on an expert to talk more about funding and financing. And so I have the expert, Ami Kazar from Multifunding. Uh, he is a uh, an amazing great guy, knows a lot about what's going on out there in the world. And I, I wanted to bring him in. He's doing so many deals. So I just wanted to give him a chance to introduce himself and let's talk about what's going on out there. Andy, thanks. So excited to be here with you today. Give us an update. What, you know, get, well, first tell us what you do and then, and then give us an update. Sandy, so we're like a matchmaker for loans. Um, we work with clients around the country to help them figure out the best possible financing alternatives, mostly with entrepreneurs or small business owners to grow and expand and stay in control of their business. So we've hired and fired a lot of lenders over the years. And we uh, have high standards we demand from our lenders. And what we try to do is quickly match whatever the situation is with the best possible lender or product for what that particular situation needs. So that's great. I mean, I, and I know... That's what really bogs down deals is kind of going down the wrong path and then having to start all over again. And you are a big, uh, a, a big proponent of picking the right lender. So let's talk about what's going on out there. I mean, it, the the coronavirus is 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 kind of on its way out for sure. Uh, the 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 economies are opening up, things are exploding, buyers are 
killing themselves to try to buy things. And, um, you know, the funding world is kind of standing by going, well, what's the valuations these days? I mean, what are you seeing out there? At least in the world you and I live in, um, the 90% of the time, the SBA is a big component of a transaction. So let's start there. And one of the things that's going on in the SBA community now, and one of the incentives is that um, the 90% guarantees and the wave of guarantee fees and the first three months of payments up to $9,000 a month for any transaction that closes before the end of September, which is going to be here before we know it. Um, so the window to take advantage of these is pretty quick. The challenge when it comes to SBA lenders is that, uh, from our experience, uh, people often get bogged down with the wrong lender. People um, assume that whoever their SBA lender is or who they have a relationship with is sort of represents the SBA, and they are the standard of SBA lending, and that's not the case. You have to remember that there are like 2,200 SBA lenders in the country, um, although there really are about 100 who know what they're doing. And each of them just kind of works and operates in their own way. They interpret the rules their own way. They have their own credit boxes. They have their own policies and they have their own procedures. And it's really, really, really easy with an SBA loan to get sent down the wrong path. And if you can send down, you can work so hard on doing a deal on like the loan is the glue that holds the deal together. And if you get sent on the wrong path or you have the wrong team helping with you, the whole thing can get screwed up at, on one little detail at the very end and just obliterate the whole thing. So it's all about, I mean, I joke about it, but if you needed eye surgery, you wouldn't go to a cardiologist or you wouldn't go to an eye surgeon who was doing his first operation you'd want to go to an experienced eye surgeon. And if you need an SBA loan, you, in my our opinion, need to go to somebody who's seasoned, has the back end, has some creativity because always something's going to come up and wants to get the transaction done. Right. So you, you know, so out there in the world, there the banks are still aggressive. They want to get into this program. But what do you see coming up as far as once this three months kind of goes beyond the wayside, uh, you know, and we get to September and now it's time to kind of go along the old fashioned way of just the straight up loans and perhaps interest rates, perhaps creeping up a little bit. So again, um, SBA, let, let's talk about 90% of the window where at first, at least to start where SBA makes the most sense, primarily because of the 10 year terms. And that the advantages of buying a business on a 10-year paper versus a five-year paper or exponential. SBA departments and banks lived and made money before the pandemic. They lived and made money before the Great Recession. After the Great Recession, they'll live and make money after the pandemic. The question is, um, yes, the economics might be a little different and guarantee fees might be back on the table and those benefits. I mean, we're lobbying to get them extended beyond September. We don't know if it'll work, but life is going to go on. It, in my opinion, it, it will still be 90% of the activity, at least in our world, will be around the SBA or a piece of it will be SBA with another component to it. And if that's the case, same rules apply. You want to go to a lender who this is all they do for a living, you want to go to a lender where, in my opinion, all the decisions are made in the same office, not across 12 states. And, and they're going to still need to close loans. They still have, uh, they make money. They have overheads to cover. They need to justify their salaries. And they have money to lend. They're going to want to make loans. Agreed. Agreed. I, 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 everybody thinks the world ends when things end, and it doesn't. Things keep marching on. So let's talk about perhaps some of the 10% of the things that you're seeing out there that aren't SBA. Uh, sure. So some questions are, as an example, um, does a business need um, a working capital component to the transaction? So there's a term piece and a working capital component. Then the question is how big at, should that be an asset baseline secured by AR and inventory or just a working line of credit? And is the SBA amount enough? And if not, you need to find a bank, and there are out there that will do both side by side. Then the other part is 
again, this is more of the bigger transactions, but if the transaction is more than $5 million, which is the SBA max, then that piece needs a junior tranche on it or some kind of a mezzanine piece, and you need to find a bank that will do that. So you have to remember that all banks are not equal and all situations are not equal. So every, at least in our process, what we do at multifunding is we want to assess the situation and we're always looking for the 100 pound gorilla right up front. And is there one? And if there is one, how to deal with it or what bank is going to do it? Some banks are weird. They won't touch a specific industry for they were burned on a certain industry before and you know they're never going to get over that some loans are just inherently not good for sba i one of my growing pains in this business early on was working really hard to do a refinancing of a, a horse a summer camp that they train kids and horses and then um, we learned at the bitter end that it was they only had girls as students or campers, and that was just considered discriminatory and the campus rule has not available. So rules come up, stuff comes up, quirky things come up, and you got to try to find those things out right at the beginning, or even when you're pre-qualifying a deal, right at the beginning so you can l learn wh what it is. Um, I've been looking around your site a little bit, and I see that some of your deals on the site are pre-qualified for SBA loans. And we can do that. And that's a really good thing to do because you can essentially tell a buyer right up front. Um, they're assuming for a good credit quality buyer, this business is eligible for this much financing and this is what you'll pay every month. This is what your free cash flow will be. That's a big deal. That takes away a bunch of the concerns around a transaction. Yeah, and we, we've seen that before, and it's a great idea these days, especially since we have, uh, you know, uh, back before the pandemic hit, uh, we had a pretty stable economy, and we had a pretty stable few years of building up, and businesses were either flat or they were slightly increasing. And now we have a situation where we have 2000, if they're going to look back three years, if they're going to look at 2018, 19, uh, and 20 and current 2021s, they're going to see perhaps a big dip in 2020. Perhaps some businesses did really well in 2020. So what are you seeing there as far as people, uh, what they're, how they're dealing with these elements? Yeah, it's a mix. And one thing I suggest to people all the time is that, you know, if you're thinking about selling or you're thinking about buying, um, sometimes it's worth it. It's a few thousand dollars, but early on in the process, and if you think it's a type of transaction that's most likely going to be done by an SBA lender, um, I would say order an appraisal from a, a, a highly used SBA appraiser. It's a few thousand dollars. It'll take two weeks or less. And what you'll do is you'll, you'll know the number that the bank is not going to be willing to lend you more than that to buy the business. And it's almost like a day of reckoning number. So let's say you have a business that is trading at 4X and it's a $2 million deal and there's half a million dollar EBITDA, right? And you think it's worth two and a half million dollars. Well, if the bank comes and says, according to them, they're not gonna lend anyone more than $2 million against this business. Well, that's kind of a reality check. And it kind of takes some of the, uh, the mystery and the mystique out of pricing. Yeah, it's based on what someone will pay for it, but it's also based on what someone can borrow money to do it for, unless you get lucky and you find an all cash buyer. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, there's certainly cash buyers out there, but everybody loves to leverage their money. And like you said, the difference between uh, seller financing and uh, SBA loan is sometimes at least five to 10, year, five to 10 years. Um, so, uh, you know, the five year for an S uh, a seller note, 10 years for an SBA uh, loan. So uh, it's very advantageous to the buyer and it's advantageous to the seller because they're not holding. That's right. And so it could be a really a win win for everybody. And I always say when you're looking at buying a business, always pay heavy attention to that monthly cash flow number. What's your monthly payment going to be? And sometimes the five year notes or sometimes they have a slightly lower interest rate or more appealing. But I'll say to you something, if you were going to buy a business and 
you were choosing between a $13,000 a month payment on five-year paper and an $8,000 a month payment on 10-year paper. And you bought that business in February 2020. And then COVID hit. What payment would you rather have? Yeah, sure. Sure. And, and, and you know, the banks, uh, not to say that they're all flexible, but, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to want to uh, foreclose on the loan. So they're usually willing to work with you and perhaps a seller might not be. Yeah, we have to, the, the, what I have one thing I can say is that the SBA was incredible to borrowers during COVID. They really were. They gave six months essentially of payment relief and extra goodies. And the SBA was very helpful and they did it again for another two months. So the SBA gave their borrowers a lot of relief during COVID. Yeah. No, they, I, I have to hand it to uh, the government. They did a good job of getting money where it was was needed. Probably some of it went to where it wasn't needed. But I think that uh, for the most part, uh, the PPP and the EIDL loan uh, programs and the relief that the SBA and incentives for SBA financing did a great job of keeping a lot of businesses afloat. <laughs> Uh, and so, and I do think that there's a day of reckoning now that those businesses that kind of lived on that or got lazy on that uh, are going to have to go out there and make money again. And they might decide, well, maybe it's just easier that I sell now. So we think we are going to have increased activity. Uh, one question that a lot of people always ask me is about small loans. Are you seeing any activity in small loans or grants or anything that that really make a difference out there? That part's harder. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, not a, something we're really good at, at multifunding at least. So the little small 25s, 50s, 75s, 100s, there are some lenders who do them. Um, but often it's better to go to one like a CDFI for one of those. Um, there's a group called Axion that does a lot of the smaller loans. And there are people that do them. Um, they're a lot of work and a, a, a lot of pain. Um, they can get done. And that's something that you have to balance and think about. But I would say to a broker out there, if you're taking on a listing, you should think about in terms of your commitment and time to get this thing sold, how are you going to get that finance and is it financeable and who's going to do it? Because unless it's a cash buyer and those are few and far between, it's going to, you should sort of solve that, I think, as part of your puzzle before you take on a listing. And at multifunding, we're always happy if you want to, to talk to you about any situation, one of our team and just tell you what we think and how one thing could get done. Excellent. That's great. So why don't you tell them how to get in touch with you? So sure. We're so we're at multifunding, um, multifunding.com. My email is akasar, A-K-A-S-S-A-R at multifunding.com. We have a great educational platform. If you want to learn more about the SBA at sbaignite.com. Um, I'll be down at the show in, in uh, Palm Beach with you guys in a couple of weeks. Super excited about that and uh, really happy to be a part of your community and looking forward to continuing to do that. Yes, you are a great resource. Thank you for being a partner. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Ami. You will. Thank you so much. Hey, Andy, do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Welcome back, everybody, to the Deal Board. And I'm really excited this week for the Deal of the Week. I have one of our team members from Transworld Colorado, Roger Smolik, joining us. Roger, you just closed a fantastic deal. Actually, one that you told me you said was not good deals for good people, but good deals for great people, right? Absolutely. So, awesome. Well, that's what we strive to do. Tell us a little bit about this deal. Yeah, this was a really fascinating deal in an area that I never contemplated. Perhaps uh, a lot of people never contemplate, um, you know, in the funeral industry. I mean, uh, everybody dies, not everybody pays taxes, but everybody dies. And so this was one of these things that, you know, maybe not be as sexy, but it's something where there is business taking place and a lot of business taking place and it's an, an unserved area. Um, it was interesting how people came uh, to me on this. Um, I had the sellers come to me. Uh, uh, I was referred among other brokers. And after listening to them for uh, a couple of minutes, I knew that this was a diamond of a deal so that I needed to be aggressive in going after it. 
and uh, basically did a massive takeaway with them and said, well, um, I know that I and Transworld can get you multiple offers, multiple strong offers, and you can work with anybody you like, but you know, uh, it's your loss if you don't come with us because we will get you multiple offers. And it's exactly what we did. At the end of the day, we did not take the highest offer. We had uh, a couple of full price offers and we had an offer that was less than that, but this was the buyer that they wanted. Um, so I leveraged the other buyers in order to bring this buyer up $200,000 to basically get a full price offer. Um, what this company does is they provide turnkey solutions for the prep room, otherwise known as the embalming room for the funeral industry. And they do this nationwide and they've done this for over 30 years. Um, the seller it basically got this business from his father. The seller and his wife have had it for 21 years. And it's kind of a business that many people don't think about, but they're the only turnkey solution like this that provides architectural design and they manufacture equipment. They have over a hundred products. And so they're the only one like this in the nation. So when I learned that there is no competition that they have, that only roughly two to 4% of the 18 to 20,000 funeral homes in the industry have been upgraded over the last 20 years and there's no competition, um, and they have 45% margins, it was kind of a no-brainer to go after this business on top of the fact that they never use a dime of their own money. Uh, their, 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 uh, their jobs are basically 40000 to 200000 for a turnkey solution, mm -hmm. and they'll use deposits of 25 to 50% in order to pay for the production of all uh, equipment, and they never send any equipment until they receive 100% payment. And so uh, on top of that, they take two to four months of vacation a year and they can run this from <laughs> Africa. They can run this from, they've run this from Lake Tahoe and from Boulder. And so it was a lifestyle business. And when the buyer learned about this, he was excited because even though they made several hundred thousand dollars a year of income, he knew that they've basically been running this business without any advertising on their own as a lifestyle business and he could grow it exponentially if he wanted to. So it was very, very unusual, but very exciting. And so that I, I wanted to go after it aggressively because I knew that we would get strong offers with our tremendous buyer pool and the type of business, the nature of the business that it was. And so uh, to that extent, it was kind of a, a very easy business to be able to go after and promote. And we got strong indications of interest right from the very beginning. It sounds like a great business. It's one of those, like, you know, we talk about in this industry all the time where we learn about different ways to make money. And like, the, you know, there's that saying, there's a million ways to make a million dollars in the world. And this is one of those you would never think of. But as you describe this business, Roger, I'm like, hey, sign me up. That sounds like a great business, right? Yeah, it, it was it, it was just different in that they had some barriers to entry in that the, uh, the seller, uh, one of the seller's husband and wife, is an architect himself, as was his father, so that you couldn't just enter the industry by yourself real easily. And that's the nature of that industry. It tends to flow many times from family to family member. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in that business for 20 or 30 years, you really, um, there's, a, there's a trust factor that needs to be earned. So the fact that they're in business for 30 years, everything just the stars really align perfectly with this, with the, with the buyer. And wow. um, the buyer's own background also led, dovetailed with this very well because he was the president of a, a tool manufacturing company with for air tools and metalworking and construction. And he is in uh, Western Michigan. Mm -hmm. And because he had a manufacturing background and uh, the sellers are, you know, reaching retirement and travel age where they just want to travel full time. And the buyer is probably 35 to 40, somewhere in there. And he wants to bring his wife in to work with the business with them and be able to grow it exponentially. And uh, the buyer and I intend to uh, make other acquisitions uh, on his behalf as well. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned too, that the seller selected this buyer. It wasn't the at first, it wasn't the best offer. What did they like about the buyer over, you know, and we've seen this sometimes, right? That the the top offer, the top valuation is not always the best offer. So what made this buyer the best offer? Well, first, um, he was, 
very interested and um, very, very sharp individual, a good balanced background in both manufacturing and in management as being president of the company, but also he went the extra mile. He flew out here to do an interview, which nobody asked him to do, and he was only out here for a couple of hours, but he expressly came out here to come to their office to meet with them and then flew back, and he, he just went out of his way to show that he was exceedingly interested, and he was sharp enough and had enough similar background where there were synergies, where they just knew in their gut after we sat down with several people that everything else being equal, they would have even taken less money from him. Although I informed the buyer, they like you, but they don't like you $200,000 less than okay. another buyer. Yeah. So uh, everything else being relatively equal, there was really one who really stood out and that's who they wanted to go with. Still comes down to relationships and building the relationship, right? It, it does. It does. So yeah. let's talk about the metrics of the deal. Everything the listeners want to know, you know, how much did they pay for the business? You know, what was the multiple on SDE or EBITDA and, and how was it financed? Did he use SBA financing? How did that go? Sure. The, uh, uh, the sale price was 1110000 and um, plus $80,000 inventory on that. Uh, the SDE for 2020 was 446000 and change, uh, which represented a 2.49 multiple for that year and a, a 3.87 multiple of the last three years blended. So um, it, was, it was a good deal. The financing was very, very interesting. The buyer was so excited about this business that he was willing to put up 22.5% cash or about 263000 and even though he was willing to do this, uh, the bank, the lender eventually just wanted a seller carry note just because they wanted a seller carry note. Neither the buyer or the seller wanted it. And the reason was, was a bit of a quid pro quo. There was several hundred thousand dollars in working capital available to the buyer. So the sellers would get a strong price and the buyer would get several hundred thousand dollars in working capital and everybody's happy. All right. Uh, the bank insisted upon this, and so truthfully, in order to get the deal done, and they didn't tell us until May, and we're really trying to get this done because we're up against some deadlines because the seller's lease was going to be up in a few days. So we agreed, uh, with the help of our expert attorney advice, we agreed to put in a seller carry to basically placate the lender. Mm -hmm. Knowing that post-sale, the seller and the buyer could do a workaround so that in transferring several hundred thousand dollars of working capital, the seller ended up holding back $118,000 and therefore in the snap of a finger eliminating the seller carry note. So the bank didn't need to be any wiser, but we ended up doing a workaround to keep everybody happy. Very uh -huh. creative, very creative, but a good lesson. Like we, you know, where you're chatting a little bit earlier, the banks, you know, in this po post COVID world are getting a little bit more particular about the deals they want to structure and taking a little bit longer time. Right, Roger? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I don't, I don't really fault any, any, any individual. I just think that um, it was in the food chain uh, with a bank, with a lender that we had not worked with. Um, and there's a lesson right there. Um, is that they, several of them were nervous and they wanted to check the, uh, the financials every 20 minutes, you might say, mm -hmm. rather than uh, uh, unusual scale. And so I think the takeaways on that are, um, not only was it a great deal, but that um, I think it's important to be careful, especially with your best deals, um, with the lenders that you go through, the lenders that uh, are familiar with you and you're familiar with them, and so that one was on. That one was on me. I would take that one on me for going with somebody that uh, maybe was not among our tried and true sources. Mm -hmm. Well, good learning lesson too of, of working with brokers too, and making sure that you're using vetted partners. But Roger, overall, like we said, a good deal for great people. Congratulations again on the closing. Thanks for being on the show, and we hope to have you back again soon. Oh, my my pleasure. And I, I just want to find a hundred more like this because I'll sell a hundred more. Actually, that's just tease it up. So if someone wants to sell a business or buy a business in Colorado or in the, the funeral or, you know, deceased industry, we'll call it, um, how would one reach out to you? 
Well, um, they would reach out to Trans World Business Advisors, and I'm Roger Smolik, and I'm happy to help, just as the whole team is happy to help. And we'll drop Roger's um, contact information, including his email and his phone number, into the show notes. Roger, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you very much, Jessica. Welcome back to The Deal Board, everybody. And in this week, we're talking about what kind of opportunities buyers have in the marketplace. And I have joining us from Transrail Business Advisors, Eastern Carolina, which is in Greenville. Um, and we have John Chafee with us today, who's an experienced business broker, but also has a lot of experience in the economic development world. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. Delighted to be with you. So I just gave everybody a really quick intro, but tell the listeners a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I have um, 30 years in local economic development background, retired from that, went into regional economic development in a specialty area, and then just sort of geographic-based regional economic uh, development organization. Spent 13 years doing that. Um, since retired again, volunteer in those organizations. Um, and became a business broker with uh, Tony Corey's group uh, to serve Eastern North Carolina and beyond. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I focused in manufacturing uh, because it's kind of what I've been doing for the last, you know, 40 some odd years um, is courting manufacturers, working with existing manufacturers to help them um, overcome it. Uh, issues that they may be facing, whether in terms of workforce development side of things or financing, um, making connections, uh, de developing networks, whatever it may happen to be. Um, so that's my um, cool space, I guess, uh, where I feel comfortable um, and where I've built a network uh, over the years, both in terms of uh, company executives, uh, managers, uh, as well as service providers that catered to the manufacturing sector. Great. Well, lots of experience that you have to share with our listeners today. Let's start with a simple question though, because some people might be saying, what, what, what is economic development? So mm -hmm. just tell us what is economic development and what do economic development offices do in the local economies? That's a great question. It actually varies from, from organization to organization. Many in economic development simply think it's recruiting the next company to your community or to your county, your region. Um, but it's expanded in terms of its definition over the last decade or, or more to where it's a matter of catering to, catering to existing companies in your community to make sure that they're comfortable, they're satisfied, uh, and successful and that they're going to keep growing rather than declining or being forced to close, uh, which is the worst outcome possible. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of that, a lot of economic development organizations have gotten into what else I described in terms of the, the workforce development. How do you work within communities with the public school system, the community colleges, the universities, um, workforce development boards as to uh, congealing a overall concept of what it is we need to do to attack workforce issues mm -hmm. community within our region to make sure we're satisfying the real demand uh, for where companies need talent. Um, the other is how do you help make your community more conducive to uh, business growth, business ex expansion, attraction? Um, and that could be associated with tax issues. Um, it could be infrastructure, um, even in terms of the traditional, which is uh, obviously capturing a lot of debate on the national scene these days. Yep. Infrastructure, roads, highways, rail, uh, ports, um, et cetera, all things that really are important to manufacturing community in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a uh, what I'd say is a comprehensive economic development organization would be interested in exploring all of those realms and identifying what can be done locally to have an impact in terms of improving the likelihood of your community to succeed in today's world in job creation. Um, so the bottom line comes down to economic development is expanding your tax base, attracting investment, keeping it, and then um, job creation and what do you need to do to actually stimulate job creation? Hmm. 
sounds, it sounds like lots of stuff. I'm assuming too, how you're talking, these are local organizations. So would this be like a statewide organization or is it more specific to a town or metro area? That, that's a great question, Jessica. Actually, all of the above. <laughs> Most instances, we have statewide organizations, and they could be private not-for-profit, or they could be actually part of state government, like a Department of Commerce. Um, certainly at the regional level, it depends upon the state in which you're working, um, but many states, New York, um, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, um, a number of others have regional economic development groups. They've recognized this, that there are a lot of issues that you have to confront, um, marketing, being one of them, but also workforce development. It's not like you can take an individual community of 10,000 people and have a major impact on the quality of your workforce. So you've got to think regionally and act act regionally as well as acting locally. And then there are like 10,000 economic development organizations across the U.S. And that's mostly local economic development organizations. They may represent their individual city um, or often would be at a county level that you'd have ED what we call EDO, Economic Development Organization. So it it's, it varies, but they are tremendous resources, uh, a great deal of information, um, and certainly any broker that's out there, Transworld broker or others, I think should make an effort to know who their local economic development or regional economic development partners are, because they may come in handy in terms of working a project. We can talk a little bit about that later. Yeah. Yeah. So actually that's a really good um, pivot point. So let's talk a little bit about, so like our listeners, um, we have some people that are trying to sell businesses. We have some people that are attempting to buy businesses. Mm-hmm. How does this, and I'm, I'm thinking it's probably buyers, right? Cause this would be a long-term relationship. More likely. Yeah. But like how, how would one go about understanding what opportunities are there available through these organizations or have you seen certain themes that some of these organizations have? Uh, yes, in terms of the economic development organizations and how they may be able to assist a broker or a buyer uh, in particular. Um, so I'll give you an example. I've, I've, uh, I've got a small manufacturing company that's one of my listings right now. Um, neat little company, niche market, um, dominant in the, in the national marketplace in terms of what they do. So we've subtracted a good number of of, of buyers, um, but some are turned off a little bit because it's a, a niche market company. Mm-hmm. But I had one inquiry and he said, it, it's it's a generally a good fit. Um, but of course, we're coming from an area where there's a real challenge in terms of finding a workforce. So right. I don't know if I'm going to buy this company, am I going to be able to get the labor I need? Because I don't want to just buy this company in, in um have to be stable, uh, I want to be able to transfer some of our activity and be able to grow that company um, sizably. And so I want to make sure in terms of there's a um, uh, an available workforce that we can start hiring from and that there are training resources or incentives that might be available to help us grow our company in that location. How right. can you help me make the right connection in that regard? So that's just one example. Um, others, you may have a, a case where you're working with a seller. And of course, our interest is always, we want to maximize the benefit to the seller. That's mm-hmm. who we're really serving in some respects, but you got to cater to the needs of the buyer mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Um, and so if you're really being strong and you think, oh, I think this is a company that should get a really strong multiple. Mm-hmm. Some buyers come to you and say, hmm, you know, that's a that's a pretty heavy multiplier. How can you justify that? And, and um, part of that may be in terms of uh, the performance of the company over a period of time, maybe because it is really strong in the marketplace on a national scale. You've identified several opportunities to be able to grow that company uh, because they simply haven't paid attention to marketplaces. Um, and they'll tell you that, is that uh, we were comfortable where we are. We're getting ready to retire. And we don't want to be working 60 hours a week. Um, so it's conveying that information. And that's where it comes in in terms of some of the financial tools that are available that most local economic developers will know about. I suspect a good number of brokers don't, and some of the buyers probably won't. Um, so, you know, we have our traditional SBA mm-hmm. you can go into. But it caps at $5 million, except for one of your guests the other day. Um, 
brought to us a new um, opportunity that would take it to 15 million. Yep. Uh, but um, that still may not be enough to, to get a deal done, it's kind of like the deals that I'm, I'm doing. Um, so you have other mechanisms by which you can help a buyer finance a deal. Okay. And I think that's important to have too. Um, and a broker may be familiar with that, um, but if not, hopefully your local economic developer would be and would be able to help the buyer and the broker convey that information. I mean, those are really two big, important pieces for the buyers, though. It's like, especially I think most markets and most industries, as we stand today, we're in the middle of May 2021, right? Mm -hmm. Workforce is a really hot topic right now. Yes. So, yeah, workforce development and having some assistance in that area for a new owner of a business could be crucial to getting a deal done or feeling comfortable as a new owner taking over and moving forward if, if you have to replace or expand the workforce. So that's huge. Um, and then we always know money, right? <laughs> Any, oh, you better believe it. Yeah. Anytime we can, you know, have expanded resources for financing and capital is important. Like you mentioned SBA, great tool, but there is a cap. It also doesn't work for every deal, right? Or every buyer. Correct. So to have another option um, is, is really, really important. Yes. So one example of that is USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, and their loan program uh, that's available. It's a, a bit more restrictive in terms of geographic availability. So you have to be in a defined rural area. But it's pretty easy to find out if, if the company you're buying is, is an eligible uh, location. And it's interesting because it may be in a metropolitan area, defined metropolitan area but it still may be classified as rural hmm. USDA. And so you just can't assume, say I'm gonna to go to Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, in the Greensboro, Winston-Salem, High Point metropolitan area, you may say, well, it won't work. Well, yes it can. I'm working with one right now that happens to be in a very small community, equal distant between the three cities. And it actually is in a census tract that's eligible for USD, USDA financing. And that goes up to $25 million for a manufacturing operation. Wow. So that really opens the door. They have similar requirements to SBA. Mm -hmm. uh, some are a little bit more relaxed. So I'm really encouraging uh, buyers as well as brokers to investigate and see, is USDA more comfortable for them in terms of what, what restrictions they may apply? Um, one of the beautiful things is, you know, sometimes there's a penalty if you want to do an early payoff of an SBA loan. You yeah. don't have that, that expectation. If you want to pay your loan off, you may take out a 12, 15 year loan and the business may be going great guns. And you say, well, I want to pay it off in five years. Well, that's fine. You just schedule it to pay it off in five years. And that's okay with the USDA because they just put it back in the bank and reload it again. That's their attitude. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a big benefit. It's something we don't talk about with SBA a lot, but almost all those SBA loans have some type of prepayment penalty. And I yes. think as we're seeing the market now, most business owners, you know, you know, not like, uh, unlike my, my grandparents and things like that, aren't <laughs> holding on to businesses for 40 years. Right. So yeah. they might, you know, they might decide to pay it off early. They might decide to sell it in five years. And, and looking at that prepayment penalty is always not fun. <laughs> so. you, you, it, was, it can be a pretty sizable chunk. And of course, an owner's going to look at that and say, I'm paying it off early. Why should I have to pay a penalty for that? Yeah. So it's nonsensical to, to, to an awful lot of people, but it, you know, SBA is a great program and it works in a lot of instances. Um, but USDA is a great a great financial tool that, uh, that we should be considering too. An another one, if I might suggest, mm -hmm. yeah. is uh, new market tax credits. Um, it's amazing to me how much that flies under under the radar, uh, and people are not familiar with it. Um, it, al it also is geographically restricted and specific, so it's targeting areas. Uh, it's a federal government program run by the Treasury. Um, and it targets what we'd call distressed locales. Um, and it, but it could be a census tract that is distressed within an otherwise very attractive and, and um, growing community or region. Um, so you really got to nail down to look at that census tract data. Um, but what new market tax credits do, it, it, it goes through a, a, 
a process that you don't need to be worried about right now, but you need to know it works for the a local or regional or statewide community development corporation. Um, and what it allows them to do is issue tax credits to investors, 39%. Wow. Credit over seven years. So the restriction on that is it's got to be in a targeted geographic area. And you got to be able to hold that investment. So you you that's the deal is you got to hold it for seven years. But what it does is it translates into a 20% equity injection for the buyer. Hmm. Like a deal, you got a $10 million deal that a buyer wants, and they really only have to come up with $8 million to run the deal because this group of investors that wants to take advantage of federal tax credits on their income tax basically is injecting that amount of money. So you, you essentially come out of the end of the deal with a 20% equity. So all of a sudden, you've bought a $10 million company for $8 million. Wow. Uh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, let me stand in line. Um, it's it's a bit more challenging and it's it's uh, there's some risk because you really have to find the right partner that's got an allocation of those tax credits and, and is willing to use it for your project. Um, but it's worth investigating and having a conversation simply because of that. The, the beauty of that is that's a 20% equity injection at virtually no cost to the buyer. Right. And with that, that, that would be something like a local economic development organization could help make those connections? Yes, okay. exactly. That's the, either a local or a regional economic development organization should be familiar with that. And it's worth asking that question. Um, because at the end of the seven years, you know what happens. So essentially the, the buyer or the owner of the business buys the debt for a thousand bucks and then cancels the debt. And so for $1,000, you've paid at the end of seven years, you've picked up 20% equity. Wow. Fabulous tool. Yeah. And and one, like, I mean, we we never have talked about it on the show, but one, of, I think a lot of owners and buyers haven't thought of because it's it's a whole a separate area of investigation. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really glad we had you on the show today to talk about, I mean, even just in these 15 minutes, like we talked about, all right, how do we get some workforce? How do we get some capital for financing? Um, we talked about uh, additional financing through the USDA, and we talked about how do you get some tax credits that can help offset equity injection into your acquisition. So really big tips. I know all the listeners, John, are sitting there and they're like, okay, where do I get started with this? Like, how do I start my research process? So, you know, if they're sitting in California, New York, Colorado, like what would be your suggestion on how to get connected to those organizations? Okay. Um, easy way uh, is to Google. So if, if you're in California, but you're looking at buying a business in Tennessee um, and you know the specific geography uh, of the company that you're looking at, one is to ask your broker. But the second is, is, is simply Google, let's say Chattanooga, Tennessee, economic development. And it should pop up and say, who is the local economic development office there and who the contacts are for that. And then it's simply a matter of placing the call and saying, I th I'm considering investing in your community. I can't disclose exactly what I'm doing, but I'm thinking about investing, you know, $6 million in, um, I may be having X number of jobs and I'll grow those number of jobs. What can you, what can you tell me about new market tax credits, USDA loans or SBA loans and what incentives you might have available if I'm going to create another 20 jobs well, how can you help me? That's awesome. That was going to be my next question. It's like, how do you frame that like <laughs> conversation, but you just did it for us. So right. thinking about investing in your community, I'm going to create X amount of jobs. This is how much money I'm investing. You know, how can you help? So mm -hmm. simple yeah. as that. Yeah. Um, John, it's been really great having you on. I know we're going to have some listeners um, and probably some brokers that have some follow-up questions. So if somebody wants to reach out to you and ask some follow-up questions or maybe do business together in the Greenville area, sure. what's the best way to get in touch with you? Thanks, Jessica. Yes. Um, email address is J-C-H-A-F-F -F as in Foxtrot, E-E -E as in Echo at tworld.com. So that's jchafee at tworld.com. And behalf of them to call me, reach me by mobile or by terms of call or text 252-933-9455.
Well, this interview has been very eye-opening. I know for me too, John, I'm going to go Google economic <laughs> development in Denver and Dallas right now and see if we can find some partners. Um, we'll also drop that contact information to our show notes for our listeners. So if you have additional questions for John or want to buy or sell a business in Greenville, North Carolina, please do not hesitate to reach out. John, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jessica. Appreciate being invited. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. And it is Listing of the Week. And we have Jenna Porzillo from Trans World Business Advisors of Bel Air. That is in Maryland, if you didn't know. A uh, hopping place, great place to be. Uh, Jenna you have a great listing for a pool company. And we've seen these construction companies, they're, they're flying right now. Yes, the pool industry is dominating right now. With COVID, the sales are through the roof. This pool company has so much business, it's not even doing any advertising and it is booked into next year. So what's nice about this business is he's selling to retire. He's been in it for three decades, so he knows his stuff. He's also willing to stay on one to three years. So mm. you can establish yourself, really get to know the industry. You're not left hanging. He'll walk you through everything. There's an opportunity to open up other locations. This pool industry has, this shop has only marketed a certain area. So you could really take over all of Maryland and even expand into areas otherwise. It's bringing in, you know, there without doing any more, it has 8 million just sitting there in revenue just coming in without doing anything else right now. So it's a fantastic business. The owner is elite on his record keeping. He knows where he's gotten every lead from, his processes. He's also very known for taking care of his staff and getting good staff on. So these are people who are you're gonna want to work with that are gonna stay with you long time. You can literally come in and have this amazing business that you can make money for a long time and be in a great industry that's gonna continue to soar for a while. Yeah, I, I think everybody wants to make their house, their homes, their castle and make a great place to be. And listen, you just checked off like eight boxes that buyers want. Good books and records, uh, tr well-trained staff, owner retiring. I mean, it, it can't get much better than that, right? Right, exactly. And the location is epitome. It's in a very, very good area of Maryland with high demographic income of people. You can't get much better than this one. It has all the boxes, as you said. Yeah, sounds sounds great. So, Jenna, how best to get in touch with you if somebody wants to learn more about this great opportunity? Sure. If call or text are welcome, my number is 443-694-5013. And if email is preferred, my email is jporzillo at tworld.com. And that's J-P-O-R-Z-I-L-L-O. Excellent. Just like it sounds. Thanks for coming on today. I appreciate it. Nice having you. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com.